today what we're going to talk about is branding okay and um, again Carolyn just call me Carolyn let's talk throughout this um, I'm gonna have you do an exercise as we go um, it's not gonna be opera that was very scary for me I don't know if it, did anybody enjoy that it was very uncomfortable but it was really cool to step out and do that so uh, good for us for doing that today okay so here we go when um, I talked about branding, so our objective today, um, because I'm a consultant, I'm just going to have objectives when we want a PowerPoint, and that's just how this is going to roll. So we're going to talk about what is a brand, what is your personal brand, um, practice branding ourselves, and then some takeaways. And then one of the um, documents you have with you is some Corn Ferry research we just did, interviewing female CEOs and what are the characteristics, the traits, the drivers of female CEOs today that are different than men and different than managers. And so I'll talk about some of that research and the rest is in here, okay? Because you guys are my next generation who will be those female CEOs. So I want you to read this research and take it to heart, give it to your friends, and work through how you can be a CEO of your life. Doesn't need to be a CEO of a business. I want you to be the CEO of your life. Okay, so we're not going to talk about too much about that today, but I wanted you to have that research before we leave. So what is a brand? A brand is a signal of what, a, what am I going to experience. It's a promise, it's a bond, and ultimately it's a relationship. So when we see these words up here, who knows what the B is for? IBM, yep. R, where does that come from? Rolls Royce. The A, of course, Apple. We're all slaves to Apple, which I love. The N, CNN, and D, Disney. And you have a feeling. As you say each of those words, don't you think of something? You, you think of a feeling. You think of an impression. You think of a, a promise, a relationship that you have with that brand. That's what I'm talking about here today, brand. What we want to think about is what is your brand. And the brand needs to be at least three things. One is a differentiator. What makes you different? What is that brand promise that you are projecting? What is the impression you're giving? So this is about feeling, not about facts, about feeling. What is the impression you're giving? And then what is someone going to get from that? So what is the contribution? What is the benefit by being part of that brand, your brand? Brand has two things. This is the classic, you probably learned this in marketing, those of you who are taking marketing courses. What you bring, so the features of that, you know, this room is this big, it's this color, it's this tall, it has this kind of acoustics in it, and what are the benefits? How does that help us? Oh, it has risers so we can have breakout sessions. That's the benefits of the brand. So what I want you to do is think about your brand. Does that make sense? Features versus benefits of a brand? So in the handout, page two, so of the green colored handout with a great picture on it, I want you to think of three to five key strengths that are particular value to your school and team that you're part of and list them as the features and then identify the benefits, okay? Does that make sense? So everyone has page two, features and benefits. Oh, yeah. Anybody need a handout? Anybody else handout? We're all good? Make sure you have at least one feature and one benefit.
I pulled this information from our women's efficacy program, and a lot of times for women, this is hard to do, okay? For men, they can jump into the deep end and they're listing these like straight off the bat. It is no hesitation. We women hesitate when we figure that, when we write this out. We're not used to thinking about ourselves in this way, okay? So step up, be strong, be confident. Think about what are the benefits of yourself that you are bringing into a situation. Think about what your best friend might say about you if you can't think about it in first person. I'll give you some examples for myself that I'm very organized. That's a benefit that I have, or excuse me, a feature that I have. The benefit to a company is that I think ahead. So I'm gonna show up on time, I'm gonna have the right materials, I'm gonna have the right deck. I am going to empower other people to get stuff done too. So my organi organizing skills translates into a benefit that I'm able to um, show up in a great way for a company. They get a benefit from that. Anyone want to share theirs? Do you need another two minutes? Oh, a question? Comment? Share. Okay, awesome. Well, maybe stand. Let's, yes. And say your name and where you're from. Of being efficient. I like that. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Well, well said. Let's get another volunteer to talk about theirs. Yes? How about in front here? Uh, my name's Claire. Here, use the microphone, Claire, so everyone can hear you. Hi, everyone. My name's Claire. Where are you from, Claire? Um, I'm from Philadelphia. Awesome. Um, so some of my features I had were, obviously, I'm a caring person. I like to be friendly, outgoing, meeting new people. Um, motivated and this benefits my team especially because when we have recruits on campus I'm always very like the number one fan for my college and uh, team improvement I really am a big um, benefit f factor in my improvement of my team awesome. very good does that resonate one more sharing yeah here we go Thank you. Um, hi my name is Rosa um, so one of my features were risk taker, like um, risk taking basically. I think that that's really important, especially if you're a teammate, um, if you're a player on your team, because taking risk is really important because like knowing that like you took that opportunity and went for it, and although you may fail or succeed, you went through an experience where you witnessed how to do it. You witnessed um, what happened throughout the process, what you did right and what you did wrong. And I feel like when you take that risk, when you put yourself in that position, you learn and you grow from that. And like I know from experience, my own experience, I don't, I don't have ball control for like soccer, but during the soccer game, my teammates always tell me, you know, try your tricks in the soccer game because you're never gonna have that opportunity uh, on like in the practice practices it's just not the same you know it's just not what you used to so being a risk taker is really important Excellent. and risk taking will you'll see is one of the female CEO traits later on as well which is good okay so now we're going to go to the next part two at the bottom of uh, page two and you're going to create a phrase or sentence that expresses your personal brand okay so take those benefits and features and translates that into a phrase or a sentence okay This is a hard one.
That's good. For some people, this is coming quickly. I love to see that. This is definitely not something you can copy from somebody else. This has got to be authentic, OK? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. You can keep writing as we talk. I'd love to hear some people's sentences. I feel like you have a good one over here. You've got that face like, I love my sentence. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'm Janelle. Um, I'm from, I go to Montclair State. Um, yeah, I like wrote a mantra that I live by, which is be the change you wish to see in this world. And it just really applies to my future goals because I see that there needs to be a lot of change in the soccer organization I plan on working with. So I just feel like as long as I get the support and as long as people trust me and understand what I want for this organization and how I can benefit it, I feel like this mantra, as long as they make the necessary changes and really like go and take those risks, they will you know, it will be exactly what it was meant to be, and, you know, I just feel like that's my mantra, make that change happen. And what's the benefit to the organization of that? Oh, the benefit is it will innovate it, it will change for the better. There's so many things that is lacking in the organization that I think will definitely need to be filled in order for it to be successful, and I'm just ready to take it on. Excellent. So that benefit... That benefit part, so there's the here's what I am and what I can do and here's how you will benefit from it, right? That's, that's another key part of the hook here. Who else wants to share theirs? Oh, good. Yes, please. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm from New Jersey. And I wrote Changing the World by Adjusting the Way My Peers See It. Um, and I work for a charity and I do all of their like um, uh, social media posts, like I make all of those things. So I wrote that was important because I think like Everything that the brand kind of puts out, I make that. So what I kind of put on it is how people outside of the um, charity see it. So kind of what I make is how the general public would see right. what the charity's goals and things are. So, oh, so the benefit idea. is that, that you are reaching more people yeah. with a more authentic message yeah. through that. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. One more? Yes. Excuse me. Hi, my name is Maria Isabel. Um, my phrase is, I never fit your stereotypes, and I am OK with that. Mm. And what's the benefit for someone to participate in that? Um, well, I am very diverse, so I can bring, like, um, like I have new ideas, and they're outside the box, because I, I belong to a lot of different groups right. within me. Yeah, well, my personal one is because I'm so organized and I think ahead and I think about the whole person that my phrase that I use with my clients is that I will accelerate the change that you need to see happen. I will anticipate those risks and help you to mitigate them. I will have impact faster because I will be seeing the broad view. So I think some of your diversity messages and the I care messages, come, that impact, that acceleration, those, those um, words resonate with others. They know what they can get out of that. So they understand who I am, but they understand then what they're going to get from that. So um, the next slide is, um, which we just went through, is we're going to do an, eleva an elevator speech here. Okay, and I don't know, has, has, has anyone done an elevator speech before? Pitching themselves? Lovely. Okay, so you can be uh, role models for the rest of us here. So an elevator speech is a 30 to 60 second sound bite that succinctly and memorably leaves you in a position with key people so it spotlights what is unique about you. Okay, so you'll see on um, pages three and four of the document is the how you develop an ele elevator speech. And it has four different areas. I mean, these are just normal interactions, right, that you would have with someone. You introduce and establish yourself. You establish the connection and then create, establish credibility in that conversation. So why are you here? What are you bringing into this conversation? You'll talk about your value proposition and then you'll close. Here's what I want next, okay? It's very straightforward. This isn't that complicated. Um, what I want you to do in the practice is we're going to have a scenario here that you are interviewing for a internship at US Soccer, OK? Summer internship should be very straightforward. You guys might be doing this right now. Um, it's a general project support and basic research and analysis. So a general you know, intern, you guys know what that 
potentially know what that would mean in a company. Your, um, the key responsibilities, in, and I, I do a lot of job analysis, so I had to write out the key responsibilities for this type of job. So you'll be assisting U.S. Soccer with their day-to-day -day program activities and operations. You're going to conduct some research, going to create some content with internal and external communication. You'll assist with programs and managing communications, work on events just like these, okay? And you're going to help with um, larger projects as a sign. It's a very straightforward type of internship role. And this, I actually got this from their website. So if you are interested in a U.S. soccer internship, they have those on their website. So what I want you to do is take a little time and write out your elevator speech for this role. And then you are going to practice on each other giving that speech to each other so you'll pair up. What I want you to do is not share your branding and your thinking with the person near you, okay? Because what I want them to do is as you're giving the elevator speech, and they can ask you some questions, some clarifying questions, okay? Then I want them to give you feedback afterwards. What is the brand that I was conveying? in my conversation with you. I want them to say back to you what they took in as your brand. And you'll see how much of your intent and the clarity of your brand has come through in your conversation. Okay, and then tell them what, or ask them what was really positive about what I did and what constructive feedback do we have, okay? But don't show them what your branding and your thinking is, okay, so that you, you guys can have an actual objective feedback. So I'll go back to the role give you a few minutes to write out your elevator speech for the role and then I, I'll pair you pair up okay but pair it with someone you don't know and we'll go through the taking turns and you don't have to do it in opera or anything crazy like that <laughs> okay okay so let's pair up here um, I'm gonna force you to move a little more quickly if that's okay so pair up with someone you don't know and practice one of you be the interviewer, one be the interviewee, and give that elevator speech as to why you should be considered for the U.S. soccer internship, okay? Feel free to stand up, move around, find someone you don't know. Who wants to share what that experience was like and what they observed about themselves or their partner? Comfortable, uncomfortable? I feel like you have something to say, yeah? Uh-huh. And did you get the brand? Uh, did you guys talk to each other? Yeah, oh, yeah. What, yeah. So how did you project the brand, or how did the brand get received? Um, we kind of took different approaches. Uh-huh. Mm, mm. Yeah, we're both effective. Different directions. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Anybody else want to share how that went? It's uncomfortable to sell yourself, right? This is a sales pitch, basically, you're making. She has a good one. Awesome. On point. Yeah. Yeah, well, selling yourself is a very important part of who you are. You are always selling, okay? Whether you know that or not, you are always selling. So I'm, and people are also always buying. I'm like, oh, do I buy what she's saying? Do I buy what she's saying now? Do I, now do I buy what she's saying? Do I buy what, how she looks? It's what she looks, does that feed in and isn't consistent with what she's saying? So this, practicing this, if it's really comfortable for you, awesome. Work on another part or help someone else who this isn't as comfortable for them. If it is, comfort, is not comfortable for you, you need to practice. You need to go through many interviews. You need to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. This is uncomfortable for me. And when I, I worked at Goldman Sachs here in New York, and I found that public speaking was very difficult for me. And I joined Junior Achievement. And I taught in public schools of, you know, an hour and a half once a week. And I taught second graders. And then I taught 11th graders. And I got much better because I got totally reamed by these kids. Um, <laughs> they were much harder than any executives I had ever worked with. They were th so much more forward. And it was really good practice for me. So I put myself in in positions like that so that I could learn and get better. So the takeaways I'll leave you with, the brands uh, must do's here, 
is be authentic. So your brand, you need to embody it. You can't just say it and, and, and dream it. You have to actually show it. So people, when I ask them on an airplane, sometimes I'll ask, what do you think I do? What, like just a little quiz if they start talking to me. I just want to see like what am I projecting without any kind of context? What do people think? And usually they'll think that I'm a lawyer. And that's because they assume females can be lawyers, partially, but also because I'm rather serious. I look buttoned up. I'm in first class with them, so they assume I'm some kind of professional. And so that's a way the authenticity of your brand is, frankly, the most important part of it, OK? Uh, secondly is to cultivate. Cultivate your brand. So how you, what you look like online, the postings, the interactions, the clubs, the non-for-profits that you're part of. The, um, you need to cultivate cultivate your brand and it needs to be reinforcing. So um, you want to have a full circle of Carolyn is this type of person and she shows up in this type of places and she reads these types of magazines and she wears these kinds of clothes and she hangs out with these kinds of people and she works with these kinds of companies. It all has to be very circular and cultivating. Otherwise there's a disconnect. People are, I'm hearing you, sometimes we talk about it, that they hear the words but they don't feel the music. Like I'm hearing what you're saying but I am not feeling what you're trying to convey to me. And it has to be memorable. Like if you're the same as everybody else, it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, she's just that sophomore who's a marketing major and she looks like all the other sophomores in and she does all the other things and she hangs out. To you get labeled that way, right? You want to be authentic and memorable for who you are because you want to be unique. And you are. Every single one of us is infinitely interesting and unique. And so from a branding perspective, we want you to um, keep in mind all of these and the uniquenesses. Um, a concluding thought here that your smile is your logo, personality is your business card, and how you leave people feeling right in their gut, not just in their head, but in their, in their gut. That's what is your trademark, and that's what I want you all to think about in your interactions, particularly in the business world. So the um, female CEO report, I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, there's four different uh, slides I have here for you about the experience, the skills, the traits, and drivers of female CEOs. So we interviewed and we did psychometric testing on 54 top female CEOs today, current and former, because there's not enough current ones. We had to go to former ones who have a very unique experience to get there. Here's what they said about the experiences they wish that they had had. So keep these in mind in your goal list. You might want to put these on your list if you want to head up to female CEO realm. The first one is operations. The second one is finance. The third is governance. And then external relations. So operations is understanding how business is actually running. Finance is understanding how the numbers are running in the business. Governance is the board directorship, the people who are running the business outside of the day-to-day -day management, and then external relations, so people outside of the business. Um, so females, many go up through HR or through legal or through finance. They miss these. Right, they don't have these kinds of experiences. Secondly, from a skill set perspective, we identified five different skill sets that are unique to female CEOs. And the numbers you see, and this is all in the, in the document I gave you, but um, the differentiating skills of CEOs, female CEOs, is first off, they inspire and engage others. Julie is just an amazing example of that, right? She is inspiring, engaging all of us in the room. Develop talent around them, build effective teams, direct work, courage, and manage ambiguity. And ambiguity is understanding what to do when you don't know what to do, like really swimming through the deep end and understanding how to get there. Um, traits and drivers are the last two sections, and these are innate to you, frankly, right now. These traits and drivers can be identified today, and this is part of our research. What we are saying to companies is that you can identify high potential women early by looking for these traits and markers. So we're looking, um, and this is going to be hard to, hard to read up here, but um, we're seeing women who have higher humility and lower confidence. They're willing to give credit to others, and they're also so more often saying I became successful because of other people around me, not because of myself. And you'll see research in here that says that many, many, many female CEOs didn't think they could ever be that until someone said you can. So here today, right now, I'm telling you, you can all 
be a female CEO. You can do that. You don't need anybody to tell you that. You can tell yourself that right now. So that take that take that box and check it because you are on your way there. Um, the second part is op lower openness to differences, and this is partially, I think, it, given the the way these women came up in the corporate world, is that they had to do it by themselves, and so they tended to say, "Listen, I'm just going to go take it. Like no one's going to tell me I'm going to go do this. I'm just going to go take it." So they tend to be a little more closed around um, the differences. That doesn't mean they don't appreciate differences, and it doesn't mean that they don't understand them. It's just that they are um, they are lower in their openness to differences. I think we're going to see that differently as, as you all come up in the world. And the credibility was lower. Again, this is about not always um, being able to do what people expected them to do. Like, Carolyn, I didn't expect you to become a, a female leader in Corn Ferry. Like, th these are people who are operating, and the last part is very independent. And that's what I, I was speaking about earlier. So female, c share, female CEOs um, tend to seek out more challenges and have more independence and be not as predictable or structured in their work. And so that risk taking is a very high um, marker for women in female CEOs today. So I went through that super quickly. There's like 80 pages in here. There's a ton of research behind it. Um, what I want you to take away, and this is what we are telling our corporate clients. So there's three ways that this is going to change. We want to have 100 women um, by 2025 in female CEO positions. So this is how it's going to change, by the women themselves. OK, so this is you. You're going to run, not walk, towards P&L experience. So that means owning a business, understanding the profit and loss statements of a business. Uh, secondly, seek and learn from challenges. And thirdly, and this is one of the, the leaders of the research, said that it's not it's about who you know, it's about what you know, and who knows what you know. OK, you've got to put those together. Not just who you know and what you know, but who knows what you know. Um, we need mentors and sponsors, which is, I think, the breakout that's right behind us, talking about mentors and sponsors, and then organizations. And we want organizations to be transparent in identifying who are high potential leaders. Many organizations do not want to do that. We need them to do that because women need to be told, I see you as a high potential. You can be the CEO in this company. And we want um, organizations to be much more transparent about that. We also want organizations to watch the feeder pool and make sure that women are in each step of the feeder pool and then frame executive roles in a way that appeal to women, which must many women want to know what is the impact I'm going to have. I don't want to just make money. I want to impact the world. I want to impact other women. I want to impact uh, Africa. I want to impact, like, they, we have big dreams, and it's not about just fulfilling the corporate's mission statements about our own personal, what am I going to get out of taking this job? What does this mean to me? And so we want organizations to convey jobs and opportunities in a way that's beyond just the money, but it's about the impact that you can have. So that's that's what we are leaving our companies with. So with that, I, I, I went fast at the end. Um, thank you. So I'll take questions. Is that? Okay, a couple questions. Yes, please. Okay, so talk about all this. How we? How do you even start? Basically, um, what made you start? What got you into it? What made you kind of push yourself to that limit and like go out there and basically take a risk and putting yourself out there? Well, I'm highly independent. My parents raised me that way. My mother never told me what she thought. I'd be like, oh, do you like these jeans? She's like, no, I, it doesn't matter what I think. What do you think? So I was taught early on to think for myself. Um, I also come from a family where the men died young. Uh, we had, my grandfather died on both sides, died very young, and the, the two grandmothers had to be out on their own. And um, so I was taught that you, you got to be ready to take it on. You have to support yourself. So it was just, that was just the way it was. Um, so I think for me, I was very self-motivated. And I went for companies that were big brands when I graduated from college. Uh, my parents moved to Germany um, when I went to college, so I felt like all of a sudden I owned it from that moment, and I think that was also a big thing for me. Like, okay, I can do. I wouldn't have chosen that, but I I can do that. And so from that point forward, I just owned it, and um, 
and I worked for a law firm, which I really loved, and then I worked for Goldman Sachs, which I really loved, and then I worked for Deloitte Consulting, which I really loved, and now I work for Corn Ferry. So um, I went for, to places where I thought, I like the people and I like what the company stands for and I like the clients that they serve. I'm also very service oriented, so I wanted to be in professional services so that I could serve people, not so I could sell things, but so I could serve people. And that is very much part of um, who I am now. Yeah. Questions? Other questions? Yes. Um, you said that you didn't study marketing, but um, you kind of fell in love with it now. So what made you move into marketing, and, and what's your favorite thing about it? Well, um, I love it now because I see you can do great things with Mark. You can move a lot of people really quickly with good marketing and branding. And I think that's partially, honestly, honestly, because people are lazy. And like, I don't want to. I don't read. I don't want to read 80 pages of the research. Like, just tell me the highlight. And I watched someone at my when I was at Deloitte Consulting. I watched a gentleman who was brilliant at marketing. Marketing. And I was like, oh my God, that's that's the shortcut. He's got the shortcut. So now I just I pay I pay a lot of attention to branding and I. Um, I watch myself be influenced by brands too. Like I just am my own little case study at times. I'm like, oh, why am I like so loyal to this brand? And so I pay attention to what that is. And I read a lot about it. I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I um, read the New York Times on Sunday. I mean, I just stay involved in, in business so that I can be smart about all aspects. Maybe one more question or, yeah, one more question. Because then I'll have a question for you. Oh, wait, you have a question. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, so with your experience with branding and individualized branding, sure, there's a difference between how I sell myself versus how Apple sells themselves. Um, what do you think is a differ differentiator between those two? I don't know. What do you think? For me, I find that it's easier to talk about a thing and advocate for it rather than advocate for me. Uh, when I talk about myself, I tend to focus on the product that I'm delivering to them as opposed to me. So if it's a skill set, then I do this for you rather than me and I'm ambitious and passionate and those sorts of things. So I don't know. In your experience, what has been the difference? my personal experience with Apple so like when I when I think of Apple I think about walking into the Apple store and how they treat me like the genius that comes up and treats me and in fact my my battery was just dying and I went to Best Buy to get it replaced for Apple because they sent me to Best Buy and the Best Buy what are they called the um, the yeah, the geek squad I'm like, this isn't an Apple experience. I am not having an Apple experience right now. I'm like, I expected to have an Apple experience here. Like, that did not make sense to me. So I really felt that disconnect. So even at the, at the broader brand level, it is about that personal interaction. Um, at, when I became a partner at Deloitte, which was its own process, which was uh, uh, I can talk about at some point, um, we had a, one of our biggest clients come talk to us, all the new partners, and he said, when I buy from Deloitte, I'm buying three things from you in this order. First, I'm buying you as an individual, what you are walking in and telling me you're going to do. Secondly, I'm buying your brand. I'm buying what your brand represents to me because that means that my board will understand it and other people will, will um, give credibility to it. And then third, I'm buying your methods and your tools and your benefits and your features and your all that other stuff. So in that order, I'm buying you personally, I'm buying your brand second, and I'm buying your methods and tools third. So I think this is why we need to work on our own personal brand because at the end of the day, people are buying you even if the Apple logo is on your, on your chest. Well, thank Thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time. And my question was, any advice you have for me on the, on the session and any feedback? So on your way out, you can circle around and give that to me. Thank you.